Hey, we have our marching orders. Oh. <laughs> Who's going to take it? I got it. All right. We're ready. Good morning. You notice we're not all tackling that one. Yeah, no one's fighting for the broom, eh? All right. Welcome back, Pastor Fred. Good to be back. Yeah. Okay. Good. Yes, well, at least the Lord was kind enough to welcome us back as we were, as the plane was descending upon uh, Fiera Le Trudeau Airport, the Lord had laid out this beautiful white carpet for us uh, that is referred to as snow. But anyways, it's good to be back. We've received a little bit of the three R's, uh, a little bit of rest, a little bit of recuperation and a little bit of rehabilitation. And uh, we basically uh, come back uh, looking forward to what the Lord has in store uh, for us uh, here in the new year. And uh, it's kind of like the theme of what uh, we're trying to uh, promote concerning serving opportunities. Well, we do want to consider. Um, what the scriptures has to say on this important passage, uh, or on this important subject in the passage of scripture we're going to look at this morning is found in John chapter 13. So if you have your Bibles, you can turn with me to John chapter 13. Christmas is now, is now a not so distant past, yet uh, we're halfway through January. Far enough from spring that we can't realistically uh, contemplate or, you know, anticipate the returning of warmth. So what are we going to do? What are we going to do about it? Are we simply going to hunker down? Are we simply going to huddle and hide for the next eight weeks? No. no I say no. Thank you. The echo. No, no, no. <laughs> Let's face it though, the January of laws may be setting in. It's funny that on the back of your bulletin you kind of have that uh, idea is uh, reiterated, repeated. Even on a more serious note though, January is referred to as Mental Wellness, wellness Awareness Month. Say that five times quickly. Uh, many issues that people struggle with though, including Christians. We're not immune from the pain and perplexities of this life. However, I would like us to bring a word of, I'd like to bring a word of encouragement by stating simply, we were made for more than just surviving. We were made to thrive. Amen. Amen. We were made to thrive, and that statement doesn't originate with me. I was listening to a song. Oftentimes my sermons are found in the songs that I'm listening to. It's like, oh, that's wonderful. And that's uh, in the song. Uh, we weren't simply made to survive. We were made to thrive as Christians. And so that's what I would want us to consider in these January blahs. Let's thrive. Let's thrive for the Lord. And I've chosen this passage in John chapter 13, John chapter 13 through 17 is referred to as what? The downer room discourse. The upper room discourse. Listen, we're talking about higher ground. Being in that place where the Lord wants us to be. Uh, in the higher uh, ground, the upper room discourse. You see... Jesus, for the first 12 chapters, has ministered to people at large, the masses, the world. And to this point, what has been the world's response for the most part? In verse 37 of chapter 12, it says, Even after Jesus had performed so many signs in their presence, they still would not believe him. So we have this uh, being stated in John chapter 12. So it's time for Jesus to pull his disciples apart, to separate them from all of the others because he has important instructions for them. My question for you is, 
What would you do if you had 24 hours to live? How would you spend those last few hours? Where would you go? What would you do? Who would you visit? And what would you say? Huh. Would cleaning others' feet be at the top of your list? It was for Jesus. We talk much about God's will and His Word, but in John chapter 13, we see God's heart, and we see God's hands in action. So as we turn to John chapter 13, let me begin reading in verse 1. It was just before the Passover feast festival. Jesus knew that the hour had come for Him to leave this world world and go to the Father. Having loved his own who were in the world, he loved them to the end. The evening meal was in progress and the devil had already prompted Judas, the son of Simon Iscariot, to betray Jesus. Jesus knew that the Father had put all things under his power and that he had come from God and was returning to God. So he got up from the meal, took off his outer clothing, and wrapped a towel around his waist. After that, he poured water into a basin and began to wash his disciples' feet, drying them with the towel that was wrapped around him. He came to Simon Peter, who said to him, Lord, are you going to wash my feet? Jesus replied, you do not realize now what I'm doing, but later you will understand. No, Peter said. You shall never wash my feet. Jesus answered, unless I wash you, you have no part with me. Then, Lord, Simon Peter replied, not just my feet, but my hands and my head as well. Jesus answered, those who have had a bath need only to wash their feet. Their whole body is clean, and you are clean, though not every one of you. For he knew who was going to betray him, and that uh, was why he said that not every one of you was clean. When he had finished washing their feet, he put on his clothes and returned to his place. Do you understand what I have done for you? He asked them. You call me teacher and Lord, and rightly so, for that is what I am. Now that I, your Lord and teacher, have washed your feet, you also should wash one another's feet. I have set you an example that you should do as I have done for you. Very truly I tell you, no servant is greater than his master, nor is a messenger greater than the one who sent him. Now that you know these things, you will be blessed if you do them. May the Lord add his blessing to his word. Let's just pause as we come before the Lord in prayer. Father in heaven, we thank you for your grace, and we thank you for your mercy. We thank you for this passage of scripture, and you know each heart here, Lord. So may our time together be a source of encouragement, Lord. We ask that you would speak to us through this passage. May your Holy Spirit minister to us, draw us in a, to a closer relationship with you and a greater understanding of who Christ is. We thank you for what you're going to do. In Jesus' name I pray. Amen. Amen. So as we consider this passage of Scripture, it is about serving. Of all the things that Jesus could do, 24 hours before he was going to be nailed to a cross, or not even 24 hours, what does he do first? Well, this is not necessarily the first thing he did in the upper room discourse. Every, every uh, gospel expounds upon the upper room, we call the Last Supper, that occurred there. Yet this is the only passage, though the greatest amount of material on the Last Supper is found in John chapter 13. Jesus' teaching about communion isn't, whereas all of the other Gospels teach on communion, but leave out this one. This part, this part about Jesus washing the disciples' uh, feet. I'm just so impressed and excited about this passage of Scripture. The whole of uh, the upper room discourse and these chapters, by God's grace, I trust that we'll be able to go through these, uh, these chapters and this entire um, upper room discourse for the next few weeks leading up to Easter. Uh, so we're going to dig into it in detail, I trust, 
And so you'll be able to follow along with me by reading ahead from week to week. And these first few verses in chapter 13 will deal with the remainder of the chapter, a Lord willing, next week. But here in chapter uh, 13, we see what is required of a servant. What is required of a servant? And what impresses me about the act of foot washing is it begins with the heart. The attitude of the servant is what? It leads with the heart. J.I. Packer used a wonderful image to speak of God's love. It goes something like this. When we study God's wisdom, we learn about his mind. When we study God's power, we learn about his arm. When we study God's knowledge, we learn about his eyes. When we study God's word, we learn about his mouth. When we study God's love, we learn about his heart. And really, we're learning about God's heart. When we consider this passage of scripture, when we consider Jesus washing the disciples' feet, it doesn't begin with the act, it begins with the attitude. And the attitude is one where it says, Jesus, having loved his own, he loved them to what extent? To the end. That is God's love. It doesn't say the disciples, having, having loved Jesus, they loved Jesus to the end. Time and time and time again, the disciples fell short of that. But yet Jesus never falls short of his unfailing love. Though at times... We don't sense his presence. Though at times we go through such difficulties, we wonder where he is. But yet we're reminded, having loved his own, who are his own? That's not those who are of the world, who Jesus displayed for 12 chapters, his works and his wonders, and yet they still would not believe. We see Jesus' special love for his own. Though for God so loved the world, he has a special love for his own. The attitude of the servant to what, this, what description is, is that, uh, mentioned about his care is he loved them. To what degree? For forever. To the end. As we consider in love for his own, we also are reminded that his love is, you know, in the dictionary, if you look up the word love, you may see it uh, defined as uh, that which is um, deep affection and fondness. Whereas, when we talk about God's love, the Bible defines it as self-sacrificing. And so, as we see in this passage of Scripture, this is a self-sacrificing act that Jesus displays in this foot washing. In Psalm 103 it says this, For as for man his days are like grass. He flourishes like a flower of the field in verse 16. The wind blows over it and it is gone. And its place is remembered no more. In verse 17, But from everlasting to everlasting the Lord's love is with those who fear him. And his righteousness is with their children's children. So does God's love fail? No. In Romans chapter 8 on Friday evening we were considering a most marvelous passage of scripture. And in that we are, remind, we are reminded that we are more than conquerors because God's love, nothing can separate us from God's love. Nothing. And so we are more than conquerors. We need to be more than just keep on keeping on, but we need to keep on conquering. And so as we consider this passage of scripture, we are seeing the attitude first and foremost of the servant. It begins with an attitude. With his, the servant leads not with their actions. A servant leads with what? <coughs> their heart. Their heart. When we are doing this in the church, we are not doing. We are not doing this first and foremost physically. We're doing this with our heart. For the psalmist says, "I would rather be what? 
a doorkeeper in the house of the Lord than to dwell in the tents of wickedness, the privilege of serving God. There was a time in my life when I would darken the door of a church. I saw it as an anathema and a curse and losers attended church. And yet here I am today, only because of God's grace, Amen. preaching His Word, His glorious gospel. And to know that the privileges that we have, we need to see it that way with the heart to serve <coughs> That room's a little worn up. At least we can buy them. We can at least buy them a new room. <laughs> and you understand. Man, this one's been around for a hundred years, and it's like. You can fly away up there. Yeah. <laughs> my room and fly away. So we see it begins with the attitude. But it doesn't end with the attitude, does it? There's no time like the present to get involved. We're always wondering, Lord, when am I going to do something? When am I going to minister to others? Jesus said, what? It was just before the Passover festival. Jesus knew the hour was coming, and that hour was talking about, of course, his crucifixion. What am I going to do? I need to get busy teaching these disciples. They're not ready yet. I need to be involved, ministering to them. The actions of the servant are immediate, not waiting for tomorrow. The question we should ask, why did Jesus perform this, this act in the first place? Well, there are several theological reasons, and we'll consider them. But one reason that may have prompted this act is that we read in the other Gospels, if you look at Luke chapter 22, and it says in verse 24, that the disciples were arguing amongst themselves who was the greatest. Who was the greatest? Undoubtedly following Jesus, hearing that, used it as an opportunity. This is what we would call an object lesson, an illustration that Jesus demonstrated here. So, as, we, as he begins this whole process of foot washing, may I just remind you that this is also a picture of, of the whole redemptive story. Look what it says in verse 3. Jesus knew that the Father had put all things under his power, and that he had come from God, and he was returning to God. So now for the next few verses, up until verse 12, he's going to show the redemptive story that began with God, and will end with God. If we notice, what does he do first? In verse it says, so he got up from the meal, took off his outer clothing and wrapped a towel around his waist. As we think of the redemptive story, it, we're reminded that Jesus, as Jesus had previously risen from the throne in glory, he came from God. And he took off his outer, clo outer clothing as well. For it says, is not that what Jesus did when he came to earth? He laid aside his glory. Not only so, but it, look what it says in verse 5, or verse 4. So he got up from the meal, took off his outer clothing, and what did he do next? He wrapped a towel around his waist. Preparing for service, he wrapped a towel around his uh, waist. You see, Jesus took on the form of a servant when he came down to earth as well. And he humbled himself. He wrapped himself in human flesh. He, let, he got up. The, the whole redemptive story begins and ends with God. God had to do something about it in the beginning. Surely we did not seek after him, but he sought us. He poured water into a basin, it says, is the next thing that he did. He poured in verse 5 and began to wash the disciples' feet. Look, doesn't that remind us of Jesus in, on the cross when it says, in a few, well, in a few hours, Jesus would pour out his blood in death. As he poured that water into a basin, 
It speaks of the crucifixion and Christ shedding his blood on that cross. Not only so, but he washed his disciples' feet. It wasn't enough that Jesus just poured the water into a basin. For, for you and I to be a child of God, something has to occur. It's the washing. I've been washed in the blood of Christ. He washed his disciples' feet. Is not that the purpose and power of the blood of Christ? To cleanse us from sin and human defilement. He pours water into a basin as a picture of that. And the water was applied. Without the shedding of blood, there can be no cleansing for sin. So we're seeing this in itself is a picture of the redemptive story. Though there's great theological uh, application, personally, as a believer, as Jesus is going to teach it as well, there's much spiritual practical application. And finally, look at verse 12. After all that he did with washing the disciples' feet, it says, when he had finished washing their feet, he put on his clothes and returned to his place. He returned to his place. He put on his clothes and returned to his place. In other words, he was finished and he sat down. He returned to his place and sat down. You see, the writer of Hebrews reminds us that when Jesus had made purification for sins, he sat down at the majesty in heaven, for the work of redemption had been completed. So we see in this foot washing event that takes place, it's a message of the gospel. As verse 3 says, he knew where he came from, and he knew where he was going. And then he washed the disciples' feet. He's preparing them for his own crucifixion. In the act of foot washing, as Jesus approached Peter, we notice something interesting that occurs, and that's Peter's reaction. And both responses are the extreme, and both responses are unbiblical. And you and I may have had those same responses ourselves. One is, no, 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 don't touch me. And the other one is, well, if that's the case, wash my hands and my, 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 my head and my, everything. Wash my body as well. Both responses in verse 8 and verse 9 are extreme when Jesus comes to wash Peter's feet. But you and I have probably been there ourselves. You see, some believers can't grow and serve because they refuse cleansing. They refuse cleansing, and that's because they're not confessing. Jesus said, unless I clean your feet, you have no part in me. That's refusing God's grace. If we refuse God's grace, how can we demonstrate God's grace? If we can't have, if we say, God, don't wash my feet, how are we going to wash the feet of someone else? The idea behind that. You see, there's also reading underneath the surface. Perhaps it's pride that's really as well demonstrated in Peter's heart. When Peter says, no, no, Lord, not me. Because if I was you, I wouldn't do that. Let me wash your feet. You see, it's all about grace. We don't deserve Jesus to wash our feet. But he wants to. He wants to cleanse us. He wants to purify us. <coughs> our pride sometimes resists that cleansing. It's not biblical. If we confess our sins, he's faithful and just to forgive us and to cleanse us from all unrighteousness. And the other uh, extreme is then Peter says, wash me all over, not just my feet. And the feet is referring to the disciples' walk. They're already disciples. They're already God's children. But even God's children get their feet dirty from time to time. And we need cleansing in this world as we walk it. The other extremes, Peter said, then wash me all. Jesus, what does Jesus say? Jesus rebukes Peter and said, those, in verse 10, those who have had a bath need only to wash their feet. Their whole body is clean. In other words, Peter, you're already my child. You've already been cleansed. You see, you don't need to be saved, Peter, and to be saved again. 
and to be saved again and again and again and again. If you're a child of God, you're once saved, you're forever saved. It's called eternal security of the believer. It's not based upon our faithfulness from day to day. Though our walk with the Lord is, and sometimes we fall short, and that's why Jesus has to come along and cleanse our feet from time to time. But we don't need to be completely cleansed because we're already saved. If you're a child of God this morning, you can thank God that he has you in the palm of his hand and nothing can snatch you out of his hand. We can be so thankful for so much that the Lord has blessed us with. You see, um, as we think of this, uh, what Jesus does, he reminds the disciples in this act that as I've done to you, you do to one another. He's leaving this as an example. <laughs> you see, and that's hard for me to understand as well as you probably. At times, sometimes it's easier than other times, but sometimes it's difficult to forgive, comfort and care for others. But that is what we've been called to do. You see, Dr. H.J. Ironside uh, pointed out, when you go to another to wash one's feet, or when your feet are being washed, be careful of the temperature of the water. Be careful of the temperature of the water. You see, some people come along with boiling hot water. It's boiling hot. They're angry and they're upset about what has happened, and then they're going to wash your feet. <laughs> no, no, that's not good. And come along and they grab your feet, they say, stick them in. Uh, that's how sometimes we are, aren't we? When uh, we come along with an angry attitude towards those who are trying to uh, comfort or encourage or to bless. Some are the other are the opposite as well. They go with the extreme cold water. You know, they're self-righteous. They're above it all, and they and they come with a frigid, a frigid free. They come with the frigid, freezing water. There's no comfort there, and it all it's so cold. And sometimes, as believers, we can be pretty harsh on judging others and looking down at them, and it prevents us from serving because of that. How often Jesus must have been disappointed, but it didn't stop him from washing even whose feet? Judas. Judas. And unfortunately, some come with no water at all. They come and they try to clean your feet by simply trying to scrape the feet clean of the dirt. You know, <laughs> that hurts. And it hurts when someone just shares a piece of their mind, just tearing into you. There's no feet washing there. You see, I'm reminded that water itself is a picture of two things in the Bible, if we're to make spiritual application. Water is a picture of the Holy Spirit in John chapter 7, and we can read verses 37 through 38. It's a picture of the Holy Spirit. You see, any ministry that you do, as a believer, and you're, you're serving the Lord, you're ministering. You're ministering to people, but you don't want to do it on your own strength. It doesn't matter if you're cleaning the church. It doesn't matter. We go to the big churches in the U.S., and we just came from one, a Calvary Chapel, where they have people directing traffic Sunday morning. They're not in the service sitting down and taking it in. They're out there directing traffic, and then they've got people like me saying, no, I'm not going to park there. I want to park there. As it's closer. You know. So I get to deal with people like me. But they're serving. The only way that they can serve and rejoice about it is that they're serving with the Holy Spirit leading. Any ministry requires the Spirit of God leading. This speaks to me. That even as a pastor, oh, I have to do this or i got to do that. No, you've got to do what you've got to do to be led by the Holy Spirit. Or else you just become a clanging gong. 
And there's no real ministry there. And that's how we need to see it. When we pick up the phone, to phone somebody, to minister to them, to pray with them. Or to be involved in the Sunday school. And I know what it's like to work with children. I did it for much of my ministry. Yes, I was a parent, and I am a parent. So there's ministry at all, but even in the church. And how often uh, children can sometimes get under our skin. But yet, you know what? The Spirit is leading me to just minister to them. But also, water speaks of the Word. In Ephesians chapter 5, it talks about uh, the, the washing of the water with the Word. In chapter 5, and verse 26. And again, Christian ministry is spiritual ministry when we use the Word of God. To comfort and minister to people. That doesn't mean we preach a sermon to them. But it's having a word in season. To minister. As the opportunity presents itself. To hide God's word in our heart. Not only for ourselves. And we may not sin against the Lord. But by hiding God's word in our, house, in our hearts. We may have opportunity to minister to. Like I said, I'd rather be a doorkeeper in the house of the Lord than to dwell in the tents of right uh, wickedness. So when I'm cleaning the church, I'm thinking of that verse. What a privilege it is to serve the Lord in whatever capacity God has called us. And there are ministries outside of these four walls. Maybe the Lord's speaking to you. Because as already said, as I go up and down the pews here, I think of how many are involved in serving in some and I'm blessed by it. I'm blessed by your ministry. But maybe there's something the Lord is talking with your heart that you want to be involved in. We leave that with the Spirit of God. And finally, not only is there the actions, uh, the attitude and the actions of servant, and that's with our hands, not simply lending a helping hand, not only leading with our heart and lending a helping hand, but finally, there is as well the accomplishments of serving. There are the accomplishments. You're not doing this labor in vain. May I suggest it's lasting happiness? Look at verse, uh, verse 17. Now that you know these things, you will be blessed. Is that what it says? Now that you know these things, you will be blessed if you do them. If you do them. Oftentimes as Christians, we're guilty of knowing a lot more than we're actually doing. And so as we think of this, there's the promised blessing. <coughs> there's something that occurs. And though we're expending energy physically, the Lord is blessing us. Our strength is being renewed day by day. It's a supernatural work of God. So may we be reminded of that. In what we do in serving the Lord, there's a blessing provided. No matter what we're doing. I was just talking with someone the other day. I did because of my schedule. I don't always have opportunity to visit. But I can make a phone call. And I can pray with someone over the phone. Yesterday we were at a... Uh, Eddie and myself were here at an AGC meeting. And one of the blessings of being here, besides eating the chicken and the fries, <laughs> was, was praying up here. And listening to... Listening to the prayers of others as we were exalting the name of the Lord and just taking that time of being thankful to God for all He's blessed us with. And then, afterward, praying for others. And it was a blessing listening to others' prayers as they were quoting the Word of God and uh, reminding God of His promises and reminding ourselves of them. But it was just a blessing. Or when we see people serving in some capacity and comforting and ministering to people. What a privilege it is. What a privilege it is. There's happiness in serving and it leaves an impression on others. Let me conclude with this story. 
There was a little girl who was about to undergo a dangerous operation. Just before the doctor administered the anesthetic, he said, before we can make you well, we must put you to sleep. The girl responded, oh, if you're going to put me to sleep, then I must say my prayers first. She closed her eyes and said, now I lay me down to sleep. I pray the Lord my soul to keep. If I should die before I wake, I pray the Lord my soul to take. And this I ask for Jesus' sake. Amen. Later on, the surgeon admitted that he prayed that prayer that night for the first time in 30 years. The impressions that are left from even offering a prayer in Jesus' name. We minister to one another. Let's not take it for granted. Let's not be indifferent about it, but let's appreciate and knowing that we're serving the Lord in the power of the Holy Spirit, trusting in His Word and living by His Word and knowing that we're ministering to others. I don't know how many times people have ministered to me and they probably don't even know. But it's left a lasting impression upon me. Let's pray. Father in heaven, we give thanks to you for your grace and mercy. Lord, as we're now into a new year, and already we may have forgotten the things that we learned from this past year or the experience, and we're in that place of just indifference. Maybe we're going through a painful experience ourselves, and maybe we need others to comfort and nurture us to wash us, to cleanse us, to encourage us. So Lord, make us available to the needs of others. Maybe we need to be cleansed by you. We thank you for the privilege of not only knowing you, but as well serving you. But we want to do this in the power of the Holy Spirit, according to your word, not in our own strength, not in our own ways, but according to your ways and your word. Thank you for each one here, Lord. Meet their needs as only you can. In Jesus' name I pray. Amen.